Well, we've been on quite a journey in recent weeks with the, uh, the adventures of David and how he became king. But the last couple of sermons have been difficult. If you remember last time, we were looking at the fallout as Nathan comes to David, the, the fallout from David's abominable behavior regarding Bathsheba and Uriah. David raped Bathsheba. David murdered Uriah. And in the midst of the fallout from this, as Nathan comes and brings God's challenge to David, we heard these words, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. David repents sincerely. We looked at, uh, at Psalm 51 last week, which records something of that repentance. But there is still trouble ahead, painful, desperate trouble. The child born to Bathsheba dies. She does have another son, but I'm not sure that having another child ever in any sense replaces or makes up for the loss of the first. And that son will be Solomon and more of him later. David has other sons, he has other wives. He has two sons called Amnon and Absalom. And we're not going to read their stories, but they don't make for pretty reading. Amnon rapes the beautiful sister of Absalom. Tamar is her name. She needs her name remembered. Too often the victims of the violence of men are remembered by the perpetrator's name, not by their own. Tamar, hold her name dear. Absalom kills Amnon because of this. Absalom usurps the throne and then in turn is killed. Has anyone watched Game of Thrones? Does this in any way sound familiar? So there is another son, Adonijah, and towards the end of David's life, Adonijah is named king. But Bathsheba comes and reminds David that um, <clears throat> wasn't it supposed to be Solomon who was going to be king? I don't think they consulted you when they made this decision, did they? And so there is further civil unrest and strife. Solomon wins the power struggle. Adonijah loses his life. So as we begin the reign of Solomon, we need to understand there are there are dead brothers littering, litter, littering this story. All is conflict and strife. As God had said, the sword shall never depart from your house. Just, just a moment to, to wonder about that. Is, does that mean that God has in some way cursed David's family? that in some way God is pulling the strings and making it all go horribly wrong? Or is it that God is simply naming what will happen, partly as a result of the way that David has led his own life? David has led a life of rape and murder. Is it any surprise that his sons behave that way too? David has given an example of being a king by power and might, is it any surprise that his sons would vie for the throne? David has taken many wives and therefore produced many sons. Is it any their surprise, therefore, that they should fight amongst themselves, that they should vie for the throne? I don't see in this pronouncement God cursing David's family. I simply see God pointing out that the way that we live has effects on others. Not 
determinative effects, not fatalistic, never to be avoided effects, but the way we live does influence others. At our best, and it's my mother's birthday today, at our best, we see something of our parents in the way that we behave, don't we? I guess as we see David's family tearing itself apart, we recognize that this is not unrelated to the way that David himself has lived. All is conflict and strife. Where will we find hope in a story like this? Well, maybe it comes with the new king. In fact, that seems to be a theme throughout the histories that we read in the Bible. Maybe the next guy will be better. Maybe, just maybe this time, they will walk in the ways of the Lord, rejecting the ways of their ancestors. Well, strangely enough, actually, God suggests that Solomon should walk in the ways of David. I, I don't think he was meaning the rape and the violence. Uh, I guess he was meaning in the ways of, uh, of prioritizing God and worship. Um, maybe he was thinking of the way that David did repent and change. Whatever. Solomon is the new king, having killed Adonijah in the process. And Solomon seeks to do right. It's interesting that even in the midst of doing right, there's a snide little comment in the Bible to suggest that um, <clears throat> he's doing right, except for one thing that's quite important, really. Um, you get this, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father, David, only, <clears throat> oops, only, he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. It doesn't necessarily mean that Solomon was worshipping the old gods, but by worshipping the true God in the places of the old gods, at the very least he was sending mixed signals. And the writer of the Book of Kings recognises in this a problem. That aside, even in this most strange of places, Solomon encounters God in a dream as he is in this place where he will sacrifice and offer worship. He encounters God in a dream and God says to him, what would you like? Tell me, what can I give you? Now, in the way that the stories uh, are told in our culture, it's usually three wishes, isn't it? Um, not so much in this one. Solomon declares that what he needs most is wisdom, not just any old wisdom, but wisdom for leading and governing the people, wisdom for discerning between the people, wisdom for leading them well. It's a good thing for a political leader to be seeking. Um, Solomon comments that he's only a child, um, probably not literally, but certainly he can't be desperately old in this story. Um, certainly at this point on the death of David, um, he's, he's, he's maybe into his 20s, but not much beyond that. And Solomon asks for wisdom. He wants to be able to lead the people well. He wants discernment. Perhaps he is looking back over the last few years. Perhaps he is looking at the civil unrest, the civil strife between his brothers. Perhaps he's seeing the family tomb bursting at the seams with dead siblings. And he thinks, my goodness, how am I going to get through this myself? And so he asks for God's help, God's wisdom. Well, he might not have been given three wishes, but God gives him what he asks, and he gives him wealth and long life 
in addition. So he does get the three. And Solomon, well, Solomon lives up to some of that. He lives long. And he certainly lives wealthily. But I have to say that the whole story of the reign of Solomon, sadly, is also a tale of how to get things spectacularly wrong. Solomon ends up being the last great king of Israel. His kingdom will be divided between his sons. His sons will fight as Solomon fought with his brothers. And the story will continue to be one of strife and bloodshed. Solomon's wisdom is not sufficient to make a difference in the long term. Or to put it another way, Solomon's way of being king is always flawed. Kingship based on strength, kingship based on might, kingship based on violence and civil strife will always have at its heart a flaw. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, you hear about how the kings are supposed to behave. If you read the life of Solomon alongside the book of Deuteronomy, it's as if the writers of the book of Deuteronomy said, hmm, these are the things that we should do. Solomon's done none of them. In fact, he's broken so many of the rules. One example, uh, the, the book of Deuteronomy says that you should not gather for yourself lots of horses. You should not, in other words, build up a big army. Solomon builds a massive army. And in fact, he makes a living out of selling weapons to other countries too. He fortifies his own land and he provides the means to keep warfare running elsewhere as well. He is a glorious arms dealer in the way that he's portrayed. It's not good and it won't end well. But it began well. It began with that desire to have wisdom to govern, that desire to do the right thing. Jesus, in his kingdom, provides us with a different model, a different way of being. Jesus' kingdom is not built on the death of others, but on his own self-sacrificial death. Jesus' kingdom is not built on subduing all opposition. Jesus' kingdom is built on love and light drawing others to him. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of the meek. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of those who mourn. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of the poor. If you want to read of Jesus' kingdom, read Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. Hear again the Sermon on the Mount. Hear again what it looks like for God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Because at the end of the day, even the greatest of the Old Testament kings, they don't bear close study. Our world needs to hear this message now more than ever. As we meet in comfort and security this morning, I've read that the city of Kabul has fallen. That the, that the nation of Afghanistan is once again under the control of the Taliban. That this morning is, seems to be a repeat of Saigon all those years ago. And that's a kingdom, a country that needs hope and faces despair because warring warlords are vying with each other as to who is biggest, who is strongest, who will have the most 
control. And as we blame Afghanistan, we also recognize that what happens there in miniature is only what is happening worldwide in the larger scheme. As nations of power and influence wage war on others using cyber attacks and financial control and, and somehow, in some way, we need a different kingdom to come a different will to be done. So friends, as we begin to leave behind the stories of Solomon and David and Saul, we do so, I hope, having learned some lessons. Maybe these great heroes of the past are not all that they could have been, but maybe their lives shine a light on how we could be to let us pray lord give us the wisdom that we need to choose wisely for you day by day by day Amen.